Good morning and welcome to K-Spring United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Tim. And I'm Pastor Lauren. We're so glad that you've joined us for worship this morning. As we get started, just a reminder, somewhere around this video you're going to see a link to connect to our Connect card. Go ahead and click on that and let us know that you're here and any prayer requests that you might have. A couple of announcements this morning. The first is there's a scavenger hunt this afternoon, and it's open to any family that would like to join. Um, the information should have already been sent to you if you pre-registered. If you didn't, just contact me before 4 o'clock, and I'll get that information to you because you will need to download an app to your phone for it to work. That is a safe and socially distant event driving yes. around within your uh, family group, your bubble. So yes. we'll be glad to have all of you participate. We've begun the season of Lent, and we are getting ready this Wednesday to start our Lent study. Our Lent study this year is focused around food. We're calling it the Lenten Diet. And each week we'll have the opportunity to cook uh, a meal with Chef Dominic, who will be providing some guidance as we cook. We'll also have a chance to have some conversation and share a meal together. We hope that you will join us for that. It starts this Wednesday at 6 p.m. It's on Zoom, and there is Zoom login information in this week's e-news. As we are in this season of Lent, we are also aware of how we can care for our neighbors, how we can uh, practice self-denial in order to provide for others. And so we are focusing our Lenten offering on our backpack ministry. Each week, we feed more than 130 students from Roanoke County Schools, helping them have a meal and food over the weekend uh, by packing up food that goes to six, seven schools. Seven, seven schools. Um, this is a wonderful ministry that we do all year, all through the school year, and we would love to have your support for it through the Lenten offering. You can look that up in Vanco or just note Lenten offering or backpack ministry on your check when you send it in. But for now, let us settle our hearts, center our spirits for worship together. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you are with us in each and every season. We ask that you would guide our hearts through this Lenten season that you would guide our hearts as we worship together this morning. Draw us together across distance and technology so that we might all be one in worshiping you. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Please join us in the call to worship. We gather in the name of the living Christ to worship God. Surely God is in this place and calls us to worship in spirit and in truth. God's love is for you and for all people everywhere. That we may share God's love and life. May we be renewed in the refreshing spirit of the living Christ. The living Christ is with us. Praise the Lord.
gracious God, may your Holy Spirit give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that with the eyes of our hearts enlightened, we may know the hope to which Christ has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance among us, and the greatness of his power for those who believe. Amen. The scripture reading comes from Psalm 104, verses 24 through 35. Lord, you have done so many things. You made them all so wisely. The earth is full of your creations. And then there's the sea, wide and deep, with its countless creatures, living things both small and large. There go the ships on it, and Leviathan, which you made, plays in it. All your creations wait for you to give them their food on time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled completely full. But when you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. When you let loose your breath, they are created and you make the surface of the ground brand new again. Let the Lord's glory last forever. Let the Lord rejoice in all he has made. He has only to look at the earth and it shakes. God touches the mountains and they erupt in smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I'm still alive. Let my praises be pleasing to him. I am rejoicing to the Lord. Let sinners be wiped clean from the earth. Let the wicked be no more. But let my whole being bless the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Genesis, chapter 28, verses 10 through 22. Listen for the word of God. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. Then he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, 
the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that, had put, that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up as a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give one-tenth to you. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever had someone or someone say to you, I am spiritual, but not religious? People often say that to me when they find out that I'm a clergy person. And well, they kind of want to justify why they aren't going to church. They want to let me know that they do want a relationship with God. However, not at the cost of dealing with the institution known as the church. These people tend to, to know that there is more to life than what meets the eye. They may have drawn close to the more in nature, in love, in art, in grief. They would be happy for someone just to teach them how to spend more time in the presence of this deeper reality. But when they visit the places where such knowledge is supposed to be, they find often that the rituals are hollow and the language is antique. Even those who, of us who have grown up in the church will sometimes ask, isn't there more to life than what I've experienced at church? Where is the secret hidden? People seem willing to look all over, spending hours and hours launching prayers to heaven. And the reason many of us cannot find the X marks the spot is because, well, we're already standing on it. We lack the willingness to know we've already had everything that we need right where we are to do and experience the divine. Have you ever thought about where you intentionally go to meet God? Can you remember perhaps the times or places where your spirit was awakened to the presence of God? Perhaps more than any other time or place. Perhaps even without knowing that you were going to have an encounter with the Holy One. I'm a huge fan of hiking. And in my biased opinion, we live in the most beautiful area on the earth. We are wrapped in the majesty of the Blue Ridge and Appalachian Mountains that surround us. And my three favorite hikes are the Peaks of Otter, Dragon's Tooth, and of course, McAfee's Knob. I would venture to guess that I've hiked the Peaks of Otter at least 25 times since the beginning of this pandemic. It's a lot, I know. There is just something spiritual about climbing these mountains, at least for me. How can anyone possibly not see God in all the creation that surrounds us? To know that there is something much, much bigger than me, and I'm invited into the presence of God in places like these mountaintops. One of my favorite, very favorite hikes was a sunrise hike to McAfee's Knob with a bunch of teenagers. 
We'd stayed up all night long. We went to a midnight movie, and then at 2 a.m., we went to Denny's to eat breakfast, and then we headed out on over to Salem and we to the parking lot off Route 311. We arrived in plenty of time to hike and see the sunrise. But as soon as we got out of the car and got in the trailhead, we realized we lacked an essential tool for this hike in the night. Flashlights. So we jumped back in the car and we headed on down to Salem to the Walmart. And there we purchased some headlamps. And we hurriedly jumped back in the car, got back on the trail. But now we were behind time. And we had to huff it up the mountain fast. Well, I don't know that my legs are shorter than everyone else's. And I have to walk twice as far as these tall teenagers. And I just couldn't keep up with them. I was heaving for breath and I knew I would never make it in time. And to top it off, well, the mountain was covered in fog. We didn't even know when we got to the top if we'd be able to see the sun at all. Well, I arrived at the top about 10 minutes behind everyone else. But as I looked over the edge, the fog was situated below our vantage point. And according to my watch, the sun had already risen. We just couldn't see it. It had not broken through the clouds. So as soon as we were all there together, the sun broke through the clouds, and it was just such a glorious sight to behold. We were standing on holy ground. Holy ground for sure. But those mountains, well, they're not the only place that I've encountered God. I can think of many such places that I've been, such as, well, the poorest counties of West Virginia or the Mayan villages on the mountains in Guatemala or the dirt streets of Costa Rica or the underpasses in Atlanta, the rescue mission of Roanoke, and so many more. Where are the places where your spirit awakened to the presence of God? Was it in a place that you expected or was it a place that was unexpected, like Kroger? Or the gym. Well, today we're entering a sermon series on a book written by Barbara Brown Taylor, and it's entitled An Altar in the World. In this book, Taylor, who is an Episcopal priest and college professor, she outlines simple practices to discover and to heighten our awareness of the presence of God in our lives and in our world, to see altars everywhere that we go and in everything that we do and to awaken to the holy presence of God around us, above us, below us, within us, that we need to look so that we may enter into the practice of waking up to God. But I, I want to make one thing, one thing really clear as we start this series. We are talking about altars in our world. Now, I know this table that sits behind me is often referred to as an altar in our church. And for our purposes, during this sermon series, we will refer to this as an altar. But theologically speaking, this is not an altar, but it's a communion table. You see, throughout history, people have gathered at man-made altars as a place to meet God. Sacrifices of animals would take place to be able to be able to meet God there. However, once Jesus became our living sacrifice for all time, altars are no longer needed. And instead, we come to the table for a holy meal in which God is ever present. Long story short, this is one place we know we will encounter God. But let's examine the Genesis scripture read this morning. Bethel. This was the name Jacob gave a place where he encountered God in a dream with a stone for a pillow. Bethel literally means house of God. Jacob did not have a plan to intentionally meet God that night. You know, in fact, Jacob was running away. He was running away from his home because he lied and connived to steal the family blessing and inheritance from his blind and dying father, effectively taking it away from his twin brother Esau. When we catch up with Jacob in this morning's Bible story, Jacob is on the run from Esau, who is heartbroken that Jacob stole his blessing and out for revenge. Alone and afraid, Jacob flees into the desert. He isn't looking for God. And he certainly doesn't expect God to start looking for him. And still, God comes. This is the story where the familiar repetitive hymn that, you know, probably we all learned in Sunday school comes to mind. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. But you see, the ladder isn't the most important part of the story. The important part of the story is that God shows up and Jacob awakens to God's presence. 
You see, after running all day, Jacob was exhausted. Alone, he was afraid, and Jacob decided to go to sleep, and he finds this stone to use as a pillow. And a vivid dream unfolds, a ladder stretching to heaven with the angels of God ascending and descending. And then God's voice, remember, I am with you. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. The God he's never paid attention to breaks out into his dream and speaks I'll stay with you always. And when Jacob leaves his dream state, not only does he awaken from sleep, he wakes up to God. He he doesn't feel quite as alone anymore. It's the same wilderness he was in, but something was different. And he shouts, surely, surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't even know it. How awesome is this place? This is the gate of heaven. Having woken up to God, Jacob knew he had to mark this spot. And Barbara Brown Taylor says this, when God encounters us in our ordinary lives, then we have a choice. We can keep on going and we can ignore what has happened or we can set down an altar. We can mark even just within ourselves that moment, that spot as holy. And that's what Jacob did. He took the stone from under his head and he tilted it towards heaven and he anointed it with oil marking the place as an altar and named it Bethel, the house of God, the place where he experienced the divine presence, the really real, the more, the luminous web that holds everything in place by whatever name you call it. Taylor writes, if there's a switch to flip, I never found it. As with Jacob, most of my visions of the divine have happened while I was busy, while I was busy doing something else. I did not make them happen. They happen to me. The same way that a thunderstorm happens to me or a bad cold. My only part is to decide how I will respond. Since there is plenty I can do to make them go away, I can set a little altar in the world or in my heart. I can stop what I am doing long enough to see where I am, who I am with, and how awesome this place is. I can see it for once instead of walking right past it, maybe even setting a stone or saying a blessing before I move on. Jacob experienced God renewing the covenant that he had made with Jacob's own ancestors and promising to make a great nation of his descendants and to give the land where his family had dwelt. And God made an even more personal promise to be with Jacob and to care for him, and to enable him to do whatever life required of him. When we wake up, look, and we find ourselves living in relationship with the living God, things change. Many people try to push this new consciousness back or try to shut it out completely. But if we don't, if we let God into our lives, that will add a new dimension to our lives. A dimension that will give life new meaning and purpose. That experience can give you a sense of never being alone, of knowing that there is someone at work out there who is greater than yourself. It adds a new dimension of possibility to life. We may not receive specific promises like Jacob did, but knowing God is at work out there can generate a new expectancy in us. It can encourage us to venture out beyond what was once thought, well, our comfort zone to see what can happen. It can teach us a new way of being alive. Better yet, you may discover what it means to experience yourself as a child of God. And that might satisfy a hunger you may have within yourself that you didn't know. Barbara Brown Taylor says this, Earth is so thick with divine possibility that it is a wonder we can walk anywhere without cracking our shins on altars. What places in the world have you been particularly holy for you? Where are the altars in your life or how do you acknowledge them? God is constantly breaking through into our world, trying to get our attention. And it's always nice to know that God will meet us here at this communion table. But where are the altars in your life? Where's God surprising you and asking you to wake up? For you, it could be the coffee or breakfast table that you're sitting at right now. 
It could be in the laundry room or even the garage. God is in this place and God is in your place. And across the millennia, Jacob shouts out to us, God is in this place truly. Thanks be to God. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Today, I present Heather Jill Taylor and Colin James Taylor for baptism. I also present John Haney Taylor, who joins our congregation by profession of faith. And some questions for you. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? I do. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? I will. Friends, they do not stand here alone, though it is an empty sanctuary. They stand as part of a great body of believers here in our local area and around the world. And so I ask you to reaffirm your commitments. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Then let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe, believe in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe, I believe in, in Jesus Christ, Christ his, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was, was crucified, died, died, and was buried. He ascended into the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Friends, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it, to wash away their sin and clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Amen. Heather Jill, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Colin James, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. As members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? I will. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? I will. Now it is our joy to welcome our new sister and brothers in Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as members of the family of Christ. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give, we give thanks, thanks for all, all that God, God has already given, given you, and we, we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in, in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. As we head into a time of worship and prayer, we want to remember all of those that are on our hearts and minds who are sick and who are in need of God's presence here and now. So let us pray together. Almighty God, this season of Lent is here again, and as with so many times before, we find that we are not really ready for this journey. So many things claim our lives and prevent us from being ready to take the steps in faith. Loving and creating God, you are in a covenant with your people. You have pledged to be our God and ask us to be your people, trusting in you in all of our ways. But we find many excuses to prevent us from really trusting you. We erect barriers before our faith journey even begins. Our time, our obligations, our energy all become part of the bricks and mortar which fashion this barrier. We can daydream about what it would be like to truly place our hands in yours and to follow you. But when it comes to actually making the journey, our time constraints and weak commitments loom largely before us. Help us to tear down this barrier. Make us ready for the journey by replacing the fear in our hearts with a sense of joy and challenge of self-discovery and discipleship. Help us to look and wake to your presence. Remind us that in service to you, helping others, we will also find ourselves made more fully whole. As we have spoken in our hearts the names of our friends and family members and other situations in which healing and comfort are needed, let us remember that we too stand in need of prayer and healing. Make us ready to receive your good news and then to be witnesses to your love to all people, just as Jesus did. And as it is in his name that we pray, we pray as he taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we continue in our worship this morning, let us make an offering to God in response to all that God has blessed us with. Let us bring our offerings, our time, our talents, our gifts to the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for all with which you have blessed us even to this day. And we offer back a portion of your generosity. We offer our time, our talents, our gifts, and we ask that you would use them. Use them, Lord, to build your kingdom on earth, to share the good news of the gospel throughout creation, to transform the world in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Da, 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 da. Oh. 
As we go from our places of worship, which is here where God meets us, which is there at home where God is present with you. We go out into this world where God wants to encounter us each and every day. Wake up to his presence. Know that God is with you every step of the way. Amen.